Yeah. All right. We're good, right? All right. So uh, good morning to uh, those of you who are joining this uh, session on development, development types of innovations. Um, obviously, one of the, uh, the most pressing uh, topics in the world of uh, commercialization is the development time. And we have a very good panel here to look at that from multiple perspectives. And I uh, want to thank our panelists first for uh, joining us. Um, and each panelist is going to make some opening remarks, maybe about three or four minutes maximum. We have four panelists. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit of discussion and, of course, entertain any questions from the, uh, the audience. Uh, so I think, first of all, we're going to start with um, Daniel Koppelkam, uh, who's the managing partner of uh, convergence partners in Switzerland. Uh, so, Daniel, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what convergence does, but then segue from that pretty quickly into uh, how you view this development time issue. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, John, and a pleasure to be on this panel um, again. Um, so, convergence partners is a Swiss uh, venture capital investment firm uh, focusing on health tech and uh, clean tech um, uh, in Europe, and then you know, supporting these companies very actively in scaling in the largest uh, homogeneous markets. So focus here, US, Germany, India, and China, and, um, and really uh, you know, playing a fairly active role in working with these entrepreneurs to navigate some of the challenges you know, of growing a, a young company. So um, with regard to the topic today, um, especially with regards to um, a clean tech and environmental investments, I have quite some experience uh, on this front. So I started investing in clean tech in the mid 2000s. Uh, there was, I would say, the first, you know, kind of um, as you as you can, you know, see. There's always waves of clean tech investing over time, right? So I think the first wave was very much focused on um, uh, hardware, you know, businesses in the clean tech space. In some cases, you know, quite capital intensive. Uh, there's a lot of hype, a lot of buzz, you know, back then. Um, you know, some uh, companies. Uh, some large VCs actually went into this space um, only to discover a few years later is actually quite a difficult field to make money, right? Uh, I think some of the key challenges that, you know, investors um, also like us, you know, I guess, uh, faced was um, really the unpredictability on how quickly these um, technologies can be commercialized. Um, so it, it always takes longer than expected. And it also, uh, you know, costs much more than you know initially anticipated. Huh? So, so as a VC, you know, if you have a, a, a fixed fund term, you know, of you know typically you know eight to ten years, to really make money with a clean tech investment, you know, is quite challenging huh? because uh, again of the the factors that I just mentioned. So, um, so this actually led to uh, quite a few investors leaving the space, um, and um, you know, in leading to some kind of a drought, you know, in in you know in this uh, you know clean tech investing and a general drive towards you know more leaner you know types of business models. Huh? And what we are currently experiencing is, a, I guess, a renaissance, you know, in interest, um, um, you know, of uh, VCs, you know, starting to look at the space. But again, you know, focusing, I guess, the key learning compared to the last wave, you know, focus more on asset-like business models that are highly scalable, may, maybe that have an element of you know digitization uh, rather than really the hardware stuff, right? But um, you know, there are some investors like Cosla Ventures, for example, that continue to be a big player, you know, in this field. And I think they have found ways to um, really deal with some of these challenges. And I think we can go into into detail a little bit later on. Um, but I think I can share with you, um, you know, also some of my, you know, opinions, views on, you know, how, you know, innovation uh, scale up in this space could function uh, properly. Uh, so I think uh, the key point here is that uh, long-term capital intensive uh, hardware investments in uh, clean tech are uh, much more challenging, especially for uh, VCs that have a particular time frame in mind for uh, exit uh, than the software, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let, let's uh, next go to... Uh, uh, Tupac Martyr, who's the founder and creative wow. director of uh, Satori Studio in, in Portugal, which is um, uh, really creativity at the uh, software level, uh, but in the entertainment sector. So Tupac, uh, uh, 
talk to us a little bit about what you do and how it relates to this topic. Of course. Um, obviously, I, I come from, as you said, from the entertainment section. I work a lot in uh, film, TV, uh, live entertainment. Uh, I do a lot. Of, I work on fashion uh, to pay for my sins, as I like to call it. Uh, <laughs> and the interesting thing is, is when you start looking at how um, innovation and sustainability is coming our way, um, COVID has actually accelerated that. Um, you know, the, the, the whole workflows that we're seeing right now with virtual production. And the idea that now you don't have to move an entire crew to Iceland to shoot something in an iceberg, but rather you can, you know, get your slates or get your your team to do it in, in one of these real-time engines and then bring it into a vault. You know, we, we just finished a show for Netflix that um, the entire show happens in the middle of the ocean. You know, that would have been having an entire crew and team in, in a boat for six, eight months, which would have been unthinkable at the time, you know, and, and so... I think the way that we're starting to look uh, at how we use technology and adapt technology to it, um, you look at something like Dress X, uh, you know, to amazingly uh, amazing Ukrainian women who are transforming the way we understand fashion by uh, overlaying, you know, digital fashion on, on people. And all of a sudden that has this humongous entry into what's been, you know, into what we're talking about now with the metas, the, Menef, the metaverse. And you see Gucci and Dolce & Gabbana and everybody's starting to move this way. So, you know, fashion is, is one of those spaces that really is starting to slowly look at what is potential to be done with sustainability and innovation and technology. So I think, we, you know, we're in the cusp uh, of in the next three to five years, moving into a really interesting place where a lot of what we're doing in entertainment and a lot of things that we're doing in, 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 in TV and film will start trickling down into other sectors. Uh, so, yeah, let, let, let me just uh, follow up uh, for a moment with that, if I may. So uh, when you talk in terms of virtual production, uh, sometimes when we think of innovation, uh, a simple way of thinking about it is, is it better, is it cheaper, or is it faster or some combination of all of those three. So when you think about virtual production, uh, going back to your uh, Netflix in the ocean example, uh, would it check the boxes on the better as well as the cheaper and the faster? I would say yes. And there's, for example, well, how there's, so? a, there's, a, there's, yeah. there's a great joke about, um, you know, sometimes you can only shoot certain scenes, scenes because of the sun, right? At the end of the day, the sun moves. And so you have to shoot within the sun. Well, in, in virtual production, the sun never needs to move. You can be at 12 o'clock all day long. Um, we, did a, we did a shoot uh, last, uh, last year, or two years ago now, Jesus, um, uh, <laughs> where we did eight scenes in different places, right? Now, that would have been, that would have meant company moves. That would have meant, you know, trucking people, exchanging. We did eight scenes in two days. Right. So so the amount of versatility that you have, if all of a sudden you look at something, you go, actually, I don't like the tree there. Someone in the software just goes tree to the right, tree to the left, change the leaves. Change this. There's so much that we can do. We, we call it now fix it on pre, not fix it on post. Right. And okay. also, if you go even further than that, the fact that, you know, so, so Ian McKellen is not in the middle of a green screen fighting a broom, but he can actually see what he's looking at. There was, a, there was a story about the National Theatre where they were doing a, a thing and they would go, now look at the dragon. And everyone would go, the dragon. And he was like, no, the dragon's bigger. Okay, bigger. And eventually they drew the dragon and put people on, on the VR headset and they realized how big the dragon was. And he was like, now look at the dragon. He was like, oh, the dragon. You know, all of a sudden you're able to bring all this innovation into it. And like I said, it's, it's going to start trickling down into so many different places, you know, into your CES, into into uh, conference worlds, and it's going to be a humongous shift on the way that we understand. And, and presumably, the uh, the individual uh, viewer could also be engaged as a participant in manipulating the imagery in real time as he or she saw fit. Right. Correct. I mean, the the, the big, 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 big thing in in my world, and, and it's something that I spent the last five years on, is the idea of the concept of multi reality that people can actually see things in different realities at the same time. Mm -hmm. And yet it's all being created by a single entity. Okay. And, and just tell, tell us very quickly, what, it, what is Dress X? I'm sure I'm way, way too old to benefit from it, but what is it? 
DressX is a platform made by uh, Daria and Natalia, like I said, two amazingly smart uh, Ukrainian women, where at the beginning was the city in pandemic, right? Why would you buy clothes? And it was like to wear them and to show them off on Instagram and social media, right? So rather than going and buying the clothes, you take a picture and they overlay the, the piece of clothing that you want on top of you, and then you get sent that image. But all of a sudden, there's a lot of collections that are being delivered that way. So all of a sudden, you can be wearing a very expensive Gucci dress or a very, you know, they, they did a, a, a thing with NASA. Like all of a sudden, clothing is not something that you're spending so much cash and, and the resources into it but rather it becomes an image or a video that you can then use to post in social media or bring into your favorite platform of the metaverse. Got it. Got it. Um, Manuela, how does that sound to you? Are you going to be using dress X pretty soon? I wish I'd known this before I would have been here with my Gucci dress. I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> um, no, but I was wondering, you know, fashion is one of the most polluting, actually, industries in the world, right? And uh, so it sounds like, uh, I don't know the, the, the app or the platform you're mentioning. We'd love to know more about it, but it sounds like, you know, definitely innovation. And also listening to Daniel earlier is moving into the right direction. Very, very briefly about me, I work on uh, social trends, economic <clears throat> and cultural impact. I also work on strategic marketing communications. I have 20 years in banking between Milan, London and Zurich. And uh, um, yeah, macroeconomics and how they affect, you know, culture in our daily life is also a passion of mine. I, um, I was very interested actually in this session because I think there is, as you said, John, at the beginning, there are a lot of multiple aspects that can be discussed under this theme. And, you know, like, um, uh, also Daniel said at the beginning, we, there is an aspect of commercializing products, which, at a practical level, requires a, a seamless cooperation between you have market analysis, you have sales, marketing production, uh, procurement, finance, and investors, of course. But but before that, we also, if we consider the wider acceptance and, and a conception level, there is an incredible amount of work that also goes unseen and often is not done and that spans in all directions. You have to onboard and get the buy-in of investors, but also consumers and public opinion when you try to position some innovative solution that actually could help tackling one of our big challenges. For example, the one we're discussing today is, uh, well, there are many actually we have today, particularly in the last eight days, but climate change being one. And when it comes to, you know, this is often the case when it comes to commercializing products that reduce or can help reducing fossil fuel or help working against um, climate change. And one reason for this type of challenge that we often have, um, all of us, is that we as humans have a typical, so there is a psychological component to this, right? We have a resistance to change and a resistance to adapt. And we've seen this in all sorts of environments. We've seen this at work. We see this in society. We see this with big challenges that, that humans have, human, human races. Many of us seem to refuse to take challenge seriously until actually it, 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 it affects us in the immediate term or don't affect us, but others. And then, you know, we can, we can wait. It's not something we do by choice, but it is human nature. And so by understanding that, understanding how we can tackle this challenge and this, this, this shortcoming and this problem we have, because we are, as, as a species, we're risk averse, which is how we, we manage to survive all this time. But when it comes to risks about climate, climate change and fossil fuel production, well, we don't really take action. And that is at multiple levels, from investor level to consumer level to public opinion level. So how do we change that uh, would be my point. There is, or, or one of my points, there is a lot of psychological research that also has been published and has gone into this. And, you know, marketing and psychology are actually quite close when it comes to it. And so it's been one of my hobbies almost to, to try and understand um, the root causes and how we can tackle all of these challenges. So, uh, Manuela, some people uh, argue that uh, there is often a slowness to change, but then all of a sudden there is a tipping point and the change suddenly breaks through and occurs much faster than was previously projected. So it's slower to take off, but once it takes off, it takes off much more rapidly than people expect. Uh, do, do you think uh, that's correct? 
It's very true. Um, yes, yes, most often it's correct. There is catalyst uh, episodes that make things happen. And then all of a sudden we're all behind it. We're all on board. We do everything possible. But in the case of climate change, it, it's, it's not happening fast enough. And psychologically, we know it's not going to affect us tomorrow. And we have choices. We're not forced to buy electric cars just yet. We can still buy diesels. And then there is a degree of, of almost laziness, right? Do I really want to stop with kids in the car and, and recharge my car every three, four hours? Or should I just drive a thousand kilometers? And what is the impact of that? Well, actually, there, there are multiple ones. But uh, unless we're forced to change often by a regulation, governments, laws, or a catalyst uh, development, then it's, it's a little bit more difficult to, to get on board um, with change. But yes, there have been a lot of examples in history that have driven change very quickly. The pandemic is one, actually. Um, home office and working from home was seen as a no-go from a lot of employers. And then, you know, in the space of three weeks, we all had to adjust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it worked and it's working. And so now we're talking about what next? How can we tackle the benefits of this? Mm -hmm. So in, in, in other words, in your view, uh, COVID spawned a lot of innovation, but not not just in terms of work habits, but in, uh, in uh, product and service deliveries as well. As well. Yeah. You All right. So ask yourself, do we, did we really need that to be able to you know, adapt more quickly and in a more sustainable way. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So, uh, Girish, uh, um, you're in Singapore today. Um, you know, Singapore uh, obviously uh, has a strong track record of uh, public-private partnership uh, motivating innovation. And uh, in addition, you're president uh, for TCS, Tata Consulting Services of uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, so you ha you have a good view on innovation in Asia. You know, we used to grandiosely have a view in the West that, you know, these Asian countries were great imitators but useless at innovation. I think that's been disproven, has it? Yeah, I, I believe so. I think, you know, there is, I don't think there is um, a specific place from where innovation happens, okay. So let me, um, I mean, it is a question of bringing the right talent together and uh, where, where is the ecosystem today in place to spawn innovation? I think that is the question rather than whether innovation happens in one particular, because of one particular society. Okay. Having said that, um, uh, let me just give you, uh, I do two jobs. One is uh, I run uh, Tata Consultancy Services in Asia Pacific. Tata Consultancy is a software um, services firm we are almost 550,000 employees worldwide okay. so half a million uh, employees worldwide all of us uh, essentially do today significant work in the area of digitization so we are in the thick of uh, what is happening around in the world of technology and we provide technology services to most of the large enterprises in the world okay. um, i also am in the at, uh, supervisory board of uh, GRI, which is the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, which runs most of you would be doing your sustainability, sustainability report based on GRI standards. Okay. So I have a genuine interest in the area of sustainability as well. Okay. But having said this, um, let me just give you a view of how TCS looks at innovation and how do we how do we invest in innovation for our ourselves so that we are able to help our customers better. The first and foremost thing, we have a two axes by which we look at it. One is what is the impact to the market and, 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 the, and on the Y axis, we look at what is the nature of technology change. And then we go and invest with um, educational institutions or I mean, we have ourselves a large research and development center with around 600 odd PhDs working for us um, in innovation. Okay. And what we do is we, we look at innovation in, in three horizons. Horizon one. Horizon one is nothing but are we able to build, an, build a new product or a service so that we are able to sell more to existing customers. So that is the what we call derivatives of our products. Whatever we are, deri deri whatever we are 
whatever we are selling today is our products or solutions are we bringing in derivatives so that is horizon one okay. mm -hmm. horizon two is is there a way by which we can reach out to new customers okay. and that is what we call platforms so completely building new platforms and investing on new platforms this horizon two is a little bit it takes a little bit more longer and the last one is horizon three which is are we looking at breakthrough innovations can we create new markets with new products or service solutions okay. and that is that takes a much longer gestation time okay. so we invest on both horizon one horizon two and horizon three with large universities around the world like like carnegie mellon stanford all of them and we have we have embedded innovation centers across in these educational institutions around the world from where we look at how do we build all of this. Okay. The last one which I want to talk about is uh, how do we build this for social entrepreneurs and we have built some very interesting solution uh, today in India where we have reached where in the last five years we built something like 45 plus change makers reached out to something like 6 million plus customers and um, we have actually mentored them and today we have taken it down to Malaysia as well and we are running a center in uh, in with Petronas in in Malaysia and uh, the whole idea is that how do you build products or solutions and and change agents in the social space and we've been investing in that I, I will talk a little bit proof if there is interest in that all right thank you so much uh, Gerish um, can you just give us a sense of, uh, with respect to these three time horizons, you, you, roughly what percentage of your uh, activity or your business is allocated uh, to each? Or another way of asking the question is for a typical company, how should they be thinking about each of those three horizons in their new product uh, and innovation planning? So John, in, in our case, what we do is, um, is there a way by which we can derive new products or a product or services from our existing solutions? So we typically spend around 40 to 50% of our budget on that because that is essentially which can extend a particular product or service. Okay. Then we look at another 20, 25% on building platforms because that has significantly changed over the last few, few years. For example, we are building customer experience platform now for customers because of COVID. I mean, you know that digitization is at the center of it. And is there a way by which we can com completely build new platforms? So essentially, 25% of our work goes towards Horizon 2. And the Horizon 3 is completely creating new markets. That takes two years plus. We look at two years plus for us to create anything significant. Okay, We spend typically around 20% of our, of our uh, budget on that. And do, do you, uh, like uh, some uh, Silicon Valley companies, um, allocate a certain percentage of each employee's time for their own creative activity, independent of uh, pre-programmed activity? Yes, we do. We do. Essentially, uh, one is that uh, we look at um, 12 to 14 days of a particular employee's uh, every year activity is on purely on uh, only on learning and development okay. i see so we create that for for that uh, particular purpose and our our innovation budget today we are a 25 billion dollar company our innovation budget is typically in the region of two to three percent right and what 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 do you what do you uh, if i may ask what do you find is the number one pain point with respect to innovation in your in your business? I think the most significant thing is the building the ecosystem so that people are able to get together and uh, come together. And the more we find that our people are able to understand our customers' business better, they are able to innovate better for them. Right. So, so we look at what we call creating contextual masters people who understand the context and people who are able to sit with the customer and co-design new products or solutions along with the customer. Yeah. So that this co-creation capability is very important, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's around from our uh, four panelists. Uh, we have a couple of people in the uh, 
uh, in the session. So please feel free to uh, uh, post a question if you would like to uh, follow up with uh, our, our speakers. Um, let, let, let me, if I may, just go back to um, uh, Daniel for a moment and uh, ask you, Daniel, you know, question that I asked Girish. Uh, when it comes to pain points in innovation, blockages to innovation, what, uh, what do you see from your experience? Um, maybe. Um, so, so well, let, let's take the you know let's actually take the you know the you know uh, clean tech example again, right? Because I think this is uh, probably most relevant also to to this session. So, and also maybe some um, recommendations uh, on how to become more successful in attracting investors, um, you know, in this field. So, what what I found is that um, you know if you are uh, an entrepreneur in a clean tech space, you know, have you know capital intensive, you know, hardware focused. It, um, it really helps if you're a serial entrepreneur, so you have some uh, existing you know, track record of building companies. This will be a big plus for, um, you know, for, for venture capital investors. Also try to engage you know, fairly early on with um, investors. I mean, there are a number of incubation platforms you know, focusing on these, you know, I've, I think I would call it you know, fat versus lean ventures, right? So fat ventures, you know, capital intensive ventures. Um, so really engage with them, you know, get some, um, some grant funding also early on. I think in Germany, um, where we are, you know, quite active, uh, we're quite fortunate. There are a number of, you know, funding sources for, um, you know, businesses like this. Um, you know, grants, um, programs. Each German state has their own, you know, uh, development programs. We have the Hightech Gründerfonds, which is now the largest, you know, venture capital investor, um, you know, backing young companies. So really trying to get some you know, kind of uh, uh, EU-linked or, you know, government-linked funding early on really to prove, to move towards commercialization of your technology, somehow de-risk it, also show investors that there's a real business case there. And I, and I think you, you have, you know, you have a chance to attract, you know, follow-on funding. Um, what we're also seeing is that some, you know, companies in this space, they're creating interim revenues through providing services and advisory, you know, to corporate customers. And also using this to you know, actually build, you know, uh, potential customer relationships. So I think this is also, uh, I think, an interesting element. And um, and then also uh, really trying to, because in the end, uh, I think Manuela made some, you know, very you know, important points. So clean tech and really environmental protection too far away for most people, right? It's not, it doesn't really affect me now, even though you see all the natural disasters, you know, happening all around us. But in the end. What, what really helps is, you know, besides the environmental benefit, if there's also an economic benefit, right, for, for a corporate, for example. So if you can actually show corporate customers that through your environmental technologies, they can save money, right? They can work more efficiently. They can save resources. They can save, you know, uh, time. Then I think you have a very strong business case, right? So really having the economic benefit, you know, alongside the environmental benefit, you know, makes a very strong uh, case to attract customers and also uh, investors. I think you're on mute. Sorry, yes. Um, so I'm wondering, Manuela, whether or not you could just pick up for a moment on the public-private partnership issue, because um, that seems as though it's very important in stimulating investment in uh, long-term innovation propositions. Uh, would you agree with that? And have you seen that work in your uh, um, business activities? Yes, absolutely. I think um, you all made excellent points. And uh, wanting to pick up quickly on what um, Girish also said, you know, that the necessity, the need to uh, be very laser um focused on creating the right target audience or understanding the right uh, target audience and segment and creating and customizing products for that type of audience. It's not just product, but it's also campaigns, information. It's also, you know, how you, um, you position uh, the challenge, the product, uh, how you raise the awareness on that particular topic. Um, just yesterday, actually, uh, going back to your um, question about uh, the uh, the collaboration between private and public, I was moderating in this case an event organized by the UK government, and uh, and we had the Swiss government on board as well. Uh, the topic was a little different: was fintech and well and financial well being. But one of the needs we discussed, and one of the opportunities we also discussed, is how we can leverage technology 
and AI to actually be much clearer about uh, who we're targeting and how and what their needs are and how we can make them more apparent and evident so that we can customize but also raise the right awareness with the right segment. And with regards to collaboration between uh, public and private and also um, uh, government and technology firms and, uh, and large incumbents, I think that is actually the best and, and probably one of the most successful ways forward. We've had examples of, um, of the three uh, or, or four um, parties coming and working together in, in an excellent way. Um, what often we're lacking is um, the alignment of some of the political, you know, sort of um, parties behind it and changing, in, you know, quick changes in government, which we've seen often across Europe, uh, but also a strong uh, strategic plan. And but when the, the, the three and four, four parties are able to put this together and to follow up, we've seen excellent examples of collaboration between government and public and private sector. Uh, there is in, in the pharma industry, we can we have seen that we've seen that in science, we've seen that. Um, to a certain extent, we're starting to see a lot of it also in finance and in the um, in the development of uh, fintech and how financial technology is really moving the needle and helping um, on social and societal challenges like the um, you know democratization of wealth and the the, in, the increased awareness on financial well-being. This is not just for affluent and high net and ultra, but we, we we're talking about you know the retail segment, the everyday people, and challenges that we have on our plate these days. Besides everything that we're seeing in the newspapers in the last few days, are you know topics such as. Of course, climate change is one, but uh, what we referred to yesterday as the pension bomb, what does that mean? And also an aging population increasingly. Uh, we're getting older, we have less stable but longer careers, and birth rates are low, they're plummeting everywhere in, 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 the, in the developed so-called world. And what solutions do we have for that? How can we can all work together to actually tackle these challenges? In that, the pandemic, for example, has not helped. If we think of one of the phenomena deriving from it, like the, the great resignation, so-called, and so on, um, this will pose huge challenges, actually, for the pension bomb, right? And increasingly, people don't know how to save or to save for retirement. How do we make these challenges and these problems more apparent? How do we raise awareness on those? And again, one of the solutions is uh, going back to leveraging technology and AI to understand exactly all the segments and audiences we're talking to and how to get their attention, how to talk to them about what matters most to them with yeah. practical examples. And that applies to the topic of today, but in general to all of the challenges that um, we're facing in our times. Mm. Um. So, um, Girish, uh, pick, picking up on uh, Manuela's point for a moment, um, you know, it's oft, we often hear, and uh, actually for as long as I've been alive, I think I've been hearing that the pace of change is faster than ever before. Uh, it's usually used as an excuse by incompetent managers to explain why they can't actually keep up. Um, so are we, from your point of view, are we seeing a pace of change that is faster than ever before and are humans adapting to that so that we are actually absorbing change at a uh, greater pace uh, than we used to yeah so um, i do I, I do agree john that you know there is uh, the the pace of change is, uh, is significant and the pressure of pace of change is actually coming in from multiple places. First and foremost place, let's, let's take in the area of sustainability okay, or products, okay, products or services. The, the today products and services are demanded by Gen Y and Gen Z because they are the consumers of the products and they are the ones putting pressure on companies to change. And if you are not changing, those companies don't exist. Similar pressure is coming in from employees as well. Okay. So if you look at our, our employee base, as I said, we are uh, half a million plus employees. And average age in the company is 28. Okay. So there is a significant pace of change they are dictating to look at how do we 
need to change into the system so for example um, the this they have i mean we, we have put together a sustainability council and uh, they are the ones who are pushing and saying that we need to be net zero as quickly as possible okay. so uh, in asia pacific for example we turned um, carbon neutral just last week okay the whole of asia pacific for this year okay. and that is the kind of pace of change that we are seeing or um, employees dictate okay and uh, the other one is investors okay people like uh, people um, uh, like daniel are are actually when they are investing they are also pushing for change as well okay. so the effect of the change is coming in from multiple dimensions from consumers from your employees from investors as well as your own customers as well okay and if in as an organization or enterprise you are unable to change then then the question is whether you need to exist at all okay. and it is very clear john if you look at the number of companies nasdaq um the average age of company in nasdaq today is less than 20 years and we are an enterprise who have lived for 150 years so it just shows a little bit about what uh, pace of change if we don't adapt what will be the what will be the future of all of us right so we can sum that up as change or die absolutely absolutely right. okay so that that sounds like a good movie title so let's go back uh, for a moment to uh, <laughs> to uh, to back um you know I, I would imagine that people in your industry just love change and just can't get enough of it and innovation they they pray for it every night uh, the opportunity to be disruptive um, is that true or is there an entrenched hollywood machine that actually doesn't want a lot of the virtual innovation that you're talking about it's a, it's it's an interesting one because when it first um, I, I'm, I'm one of the worst examples in the world I, I'm, well, I'm you know I'm just, I'm good, just I'm on good. this issue just on this <laughs> issue it, because uh, because I am I, you know they, I'm I'm the boat that that is breaking the ice you know I'm usually at the forefront of technology and trying to advance all the things which is usually um, a dangerous place to play in but also it's it's really interesting to to push that forward and what we see obviously it's uh, you know at the end of the day we there's investors and there's producers and you know, big studios and big things behind it. So obviously they will be safe. Um, so yes, we, we keep pushing and there's a lot of innovation that comes out of what we do. So for example, right now, um, you think about tracking, right? Tracking systems, which nowadays we take them for granted. You know, you put on a VR headset and you, you expect them to track you. Like you, you do not question it. And yet back in 2011, it was not something that was done. And it was the it was the entertainment industry that pushed that to that level. Um, I'll give you one of my favorite examples, and also because because we have somebody here. So, um, Formula One, who who we've worked with before. Um, I don't know how much you know what goes behind the scenes, but so much of the technology that is done, not just in the car and how that trickles down to the everyday road car, but what is done in the transmission of the show. And having all those cameras and all those connectivities and having all these possibilities, you know, those are the types of communication that slowly are trickling down to, to us to being able to do the jobs that we do nowadays. You know, it's, it's insane when you think that there's so many cameras, so many um, audios, so many cars to track, all these little things, and they're all done in real time. And within seconds, the producer and the director can call any camera, any audio, any moment, any any type of data from any of these cars in real time. It's ridiculous, yeah? And obviously, I'm not saying that people need to have that on their fingertips right now, but it's how it trickles down into all the different innovations that we keep getting yeah. across our different systems. So let, let, let me ask each of you, uh, just to close it out, maybe starting with uh, Gerish, you know, an interesting uh, statement uh, that I've heard for many years is the future has already been invented. You just can't buy it at retail. Um, do you believe that's true? Do you, that's the trickle down concept that Tupac is uh, alluding to. Um, I think the future, we have to create it. Okay? Uh, we have the opportunity to create the future in the way that we think we need to create. Okay? And um, I strongly believe 
um, the what is the pandemic has taught us many things and one of the things the pandemic has taught us is that we can't do the same thing uh, the way we were doing before we have to reimagine the future and to reimagine the future we need to put a few hats together the first and foremost hat that we need to probably put together is the whole thing about digitization the second thing is all about how do we come together as a society and the, and uh, i mean like what i mean the, the the most significant thing john that we have seen is in nine months lad we were able to develop a vaccine during the time of crisis which is perhaps the single most thing mm-hmm. where uh, where uh, where everybody got together to solve a particular problem okay. and the third one is all about think sustainability think about what is what is good for the society at large and build solutions around it if you are able to bring all of these things together then i think we can create a future which is more future proof okay uh manuela uh final word I fully agree with that. I think we there is a lot we can change. There is a lot we can do. We can rewrite. Two takeaways for me. One is that there is volumes of psychological research that tries to explain why we miscalculate risk. True for climate change. True for um, the current uh, Russian government. Um, and we need to learn to to manage that. And we need to work on. Here is my keyword: the AQ, adaptability quotient of all of us. and improve that that is goes hand in hand also with leadership with leadership skills that we show daily at home in our working places in society as citizens and so understanding why we react in certain ways what it is that we do wrong how we can change it and how we can constantly adapt to build the future that we want well stated thank you and uh, final word from uh, daniel you're on mute daniel i agree with the statement that the future has been invented already i mean there's an awful you know lot of innovation out there unfortunately uh, most of this innovation never ac- actually makes it to commercialization right and this is really due to largely due to lack of funding so what i would like to see especially here in europe is additional funding sources uh, being opened for example institutional investors Uh, increasing the allocation to venture capital which is still minuscule you know compared to the US uh, for example also um allowing um uh, more private investors to start engaging in venture capital and i think you know switzerland is actually here uh, also making very good progress where there are a number of structures now available uh, you know for, for people to participate here and then also corporates right i mean corporates dedicating more money to support this really early stage risk you know funding risk this value of debt you know towards a commercialization so this would be my wish list all right super well thanks for a great uh, panel you know it's a little bit odd to have someone from academia sharing a panel on innovation because frankly academia really needs a good kick in that regard um uh so uh, i i've learned a lot just by listening to uh, all of your uh, excellent points and uh, i think we have an important session as part of the program at the top of the hour so i want to give everybody a chance to uh, uh reorient and get ready for the uh, special session the special plenary uh, that we have arranged but once again nice to meet you all thank you for those who've attended and uh look forward to seeing you in person at some point at a future horasis event thank you thank you thank you thank you